Hello guys and gals and welcome. So today I have something special for you. Um, just yesterday there was a video that was released, uh, kind of a behind the scenes uh, video that went over uh, kind of like the, the rationality and thinking for Diablo 2 Resurrected, uh, the difference between consoles and PCs, uh, all sorts of interesting little tidbits. Um, but this is more of a deep dive than anything else. And, uh, and I kind of wanted to go over it and uh, talk about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to play the, um, obviously, the, the clip. Uh, and when I say clip, I mean it's an hour and 40 minutes, so it's pretty much a movie. And uh, we're going to talk about the various things that they go over. Um, if you want to watch the original clip without my commentary, uh, by all means, I will have the link down in the description for you guys and gals. Um, otherwise, buckle up, because we've, uh, we've got quite a ways to go on this. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Gnome live stream. I'm your host, Adam Hartel. And uh, tonight's event is going to be behind the scenes of Diablo 2 Resurrected. Uh, we have an amazing guest, which I'll introduce in just a moment this evening. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to uh, mention that if you're in need of closed captioning uh, for today's stream, uh, you can head over to Noman's Facebook page and cap catch our Facebook live feed uh, where there is closed captioning. Um, today's stream is also going to be available as video on demand on our Twitch and YouTube channels uh, pretty much immediately after we finish streaming. Uh, so with that, I also want to thank Lenovo for sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, thanks to Lenovo's uh, generous sponsorship, we are able at Noman to continue to provide free educational content, inspirational streams, amazing interviews with fantastic artists, and tonight is no exception. Uh, so um, before we bring our guest on screen, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit our, about our guest, uh, Rob Gallerani. He is the design director for Diablo II Resurrected. Rob joined uh, Vicarious Visions, which is now part of Blizzard Entertainment, over 21 years ago, uh, where he first, where his first project was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on the Game Boy Advance. He's since contributed to a wide range of games and franchises, including Tony Hawk, Guitar Hero, and Skylanders. And then in 2016, he was the design lead on the Warmind expansion for Destiny 2 and led the puzzle team on the game's Black Armory expansion in 2018. His latest efforts have been leading the creation and release of Diablo II Resurrected, his 30th game title shipped. Uh, when not designing video games, Rob runs home, homebrew tabletop games and ARGs. Apart from games, he makes pasta, blacksmiths, runs obstacle courses, and spends time with his amazing wife and two daughters. And with that, I want to say, Rob, welcome to the stream. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, look at all those freaking games in the back. Look, he's got all the old school boxes. He's got everything. I kind of wish I had a better quality uh, image so I could literally go over and look at all those. But I mean, you can you can tell what some of them are. I mean, there's obviously some Diablo up there. Um, I, I think I see some Kingdoms. I see a whole bunch of different games up there, and just probably even games that maybe he's worked on over his lifetime. Who knows? Oh, thank you so much for being a part of this. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be fun. So, um, pasta and blacksmith. I, I just, I love reading those two things back to back in your bio. That's amazing. It's eclectic. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you're actually a blacksmith. You're making things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, years ago, it was one of those things I always really liked, even as like a, you know, a kid. Um, and I grew up on a farm in upstate New York and like making maple syrup. We had like a, a big burner that would sit under the syrup and i don't know you have to watch that thing and it's so boring even as a kid but so what you do is you take the little poker and you stick it in the fire and you leave it there long enough and it gets hot and then i was like i've seen this in movies and you'd hit it with a hammer and i bent it all out of shape and my dad's like what the hell are you doing with all my tools <laughs> um but as i got older like having a forge is not something you just think oh you know i just stick it in the closet when it's like you kind of need all the stuff and right. uh i think Oh, probably like 15 years ago, um, I was in just kind of looking online for something. And there was like this little blurb about like a local blacksmith chapter. And I'm like, oh, what? And like the the article was like already two years old. And I was like, I don't even know if they're still there. I'm like, sure, I'll go check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I show up and it's just like a bunch of like 80 year old people. And they're all like, oh, yeah. This is it. And I'm like, this is the most surreal thing ever. And so I just kind of got fell in with them. And I think my second like visit there someone was like i'm getting rid of an only anvil and i was like I i'll take the anvil like 
because you do need an anvil. That's kind of the thing, right? Um, right. Getting fire actually is pretty easy. It's not safe. There's many ways to do it unsafe. Um, but mm -hmm. you can get like wood up to like melt steel hot if you have a hair dryer, right? Like air wow. and fuel. So a uh, so little bit of, uh, of, of background about me as well. I also do um, a lot of work in, uh, in, in smithing and things like that. I've actually poured metal. Uh, I had a foundry. I used to melt aluminum and pour shapes and all sorts of cool stuff like that. And, uh, and I even have literally like some really awesome pictures, um, literally of me like melting metal. And it's probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. Uh, at least that's how I feel about it. And, uh, he's not wrong. Um, you know, getting, getting the metal up to temperature is not exactly the most difficult thing. Uh, what's actually the more difficult thing is having a really nice anvil. Um, he's, he's a hundred percent correct on this because I've, I've actually had to like do some research on this myself because I, I did want to do kind of blacksmithing kind of work. And uh, one of the things that you find out with blacksmithing work is that not just any anvil will work. It has to be a good anvil. It can't be a garbage anvil. So, uh, you know, since we're talking about this kind of stuff, I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you my old uh, my old furnace in action. I actually have a video of me melting down some aluminum uh, to pour it into a new shape. Uh, this is it. It's pretty cool, huh? Um, but you can get, like, wood up to like melt steel hot if you have a hair dryer, right? Like air wow. and fuel, you just go through a lot of wood real quick. And then I shifted to yeah. coal, but coal is, uh, it's really dirty and it, you can't just go to the store and get like, oh, I'll get a bunch of blacksmith coal. Like, So the difference between coal and uh, charcoal, uh, which you can get in the store, by the way, is that charcoal burns hotter uh, because it has more, more uh, porous facets in it uh, that catch the air better. And uh, so I eventually just started buying charcoal when it was on sale uh, and using that, which was uh, honestly better. Like you kind of have to buy it by the ton now. And I'm like, I don't. So I finally switched to propane, but yeah. And then, Goodness. Uh, yeah, I'm very Italian. And if I didn't make pasta, some one of my ancestors would be very <laughs> Italian. So. Well, I, I love how um, boredom around the kettle boiling, that, that was... That was the origin. That's where you developed that superpower. And I feel like boredom is, has done that for a lot of people um, <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Um, before we, because I, I know you've got some amazing stuff to talk to us about tonight. Um, you're going to be presenting some really cool things. But before we jump into that, could you share with us, just as you did with, with blacksmithing, a little bit about your personal origin story um, mm -hmm. as a creative and what led you, what led you to design games? Yeah, so um, like... Games were not like, I think when I was younger, I always wanted to be an archaeologist because everyone wanted to be an archaeologist or Indiana Jones or something like that. Uh, and when, um, but I always had games, like I would make games, I would modify games. I remember there was the, an old game called Talisman um, that was at like my after school thing. And it didn't even have all the pieces. It was like someone had donated, they didn't even know what the game was. And I'd love to think, I even ended up making like my own version of Talisman. Um, and so I always kind of was into games. But I never saw it as like, oh, you could really, you could do that as a job, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in high school, um, around like 10th grade, I started getting into architecture because I was like, I like drawing and I like building. I'm like, put them together, right? Architects are cool. And uh, the program had CAD. So I, you did all the drafting. Yeah. And I actually uh -huh. blueprint, I printed blueprints and plotted things and... I almost broke the plotter. Like, don't try to print a fireplace brick by brick, top down. Your shop teacher will get very mad at you. But once I got into AutoCAD, I was like, you can you can move stuff around and everything. And, and back then, there was like Adobe Dimensions and Stratus mm -hmm. Pro. Uh, and so I started getting into 3D. And we had a, a group that partnered with the high school called The Learning Web. And I was like, hey, can I get into computer animation? And this was like the late 90s. And they're like, what the heck are you talking about? And I was like, just look it up. And I ended up uh, apprenticing with the animation studio that made the intro to Reading Rainbow. If you've ever no remember the show, Reading Rainbow? Oh, yeah. yeah. Butterfly in yeah. the Sky, right? Yeah. Um, Butterfly in the Sky. I can go twice as high. And so uh, they were old school all the way, like drawing on acetate, 
but they wanted to get into CG. And they're like, well, you could help us learn it. And so I got to animate the number 13 for Sesame Street. There was a little alien that had to count spaceships. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I was like, okay, I, I love this. I ended up going to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, got a degree there. And when I got out, I didn't even know. I was like, do I do movies? Do I do video games? Um, also, I saw a question. My favorite game is Pandemic Legacy. Super easy. Everyone always asks <laughs> yeah. it with my background. Um, oh, and I, I should mention really quickly, guys. Uh, yeah, definitely be typing your questions in the chat. We'll address some of them in real time, but we also are going to be taking time at the yeah. end of the stream to jump into that. So uh, I got a call from my recruiter at college, and they were like, hey, have you ever heard of a company called Vicarious Visions? They're in Troy, New York. And I'm like, never heard of them. And I've been to Troy. There's no video game companies in Troy. And they're like, it's two hours away from you. I'm like, well, okay. And I drove over there and um, Andy Lomerson, who's an amazing uh, artist, VFX artist, I still work with him to this day. Um, he had a pizza box with two screen, with a screen and a circuit board. Who's that? It's our bed and breakfast. Uh, so I actually found a picture of the, um, the game that he's talking about. Um, I thought, you know, just for, for fun, I'd bring it up on stream because he said this is his favorite game. So uh, this is uh, Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Apparently there's multiple seasons. Um, there's Season 2. It looks like Season 3. I'm not really sure if it's only a board game or if it's actually, like, a playable game. But everything that I'm searching for right now has... Uh, it seems to be a board game. I don't really see any... Like like actual game game version. Like, is there a PC game version of this? Somebody apparently asking why aren't legacy games released in digital format? Apparently, they're not released in digital format. So interesting. Hmm. Uh, taped to it and a SNES controller wired into it. And I'm like, what do you guys do? And they're like, oh, we just got our dev kit from Nintendo for the Game Boy Advance. And I was like, what are you guys making? And they're like, uh, Tony Hawk 2. And I was like, and that was kind of it. I was like, sign me up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I did, and I, I, I mean, back then, like, I think I was employee 27 and you didn't hire designers, you didn't hire animators. It was like engineer or artist. And if you wanted to design something cool, start working on it, right? Because they're a team of like seven people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I did art for a couple of years, but around, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, I, I really found out that I loved from an animation standpoint, like player handling and animation and mm -hmm. player handling go hand to hand. I kind of shifted to design and then one thing led to another and design, senior design, design, you know, all the way up to being the studio design director at VV before we were merged over and being directors on projects. So, um, yeah, that's it in a nutshell without me blowing the whole night, just talking about that. Sure. Yeah, but that's quite a story. Um, <laughs> And I mean, just just reading through your bio and everything we're going to hear about tonight, I think what's amazing about the major vast majority of games that you've had a hand in, um, these are really special games that span some pretty special times, I think, in gaming. Um, you, you've got a wide audience of people that originally loved this stuff when it come out, when it came out. And, you know, I mentioned to even my 15 year old son that I was going to be talking with you tonight in the games that you've worked on, he was like, well, that's amazing. So. It's really cool how I think a lot of these games have stayed with people and are even like finding younger audiences again today, um, which I think definitely speaks to the quality of the experience you know, that was provided um, and the way the game was set up. So uh, a little bit of a tidbit of information that I think I've, I've kind of figured out here is that uh, those I thought I originally thought that those boxes in the background were PC games or, you know, like uh, like, you know, digital games. Honestly, I think pretty much all of those in the background are board games. I think Rob Gallerani uh, really likes board games. Um, I mean, you can you can tell by his choice, uh, and that's kind of what tipped me off, is that the game that he picked as his favorite was literally a board game. And I think that literally all of these in the background are board games. Okay. okay. I have a uh, whole yeah. slide on that, even two slides. Oh, cool. Well, I'm, I'm going to stop nerding out. I'm going to hop, well, I'm going to nerd out silently in the sidecar, but I'm going to pass the microphone to you. And if you want, we'll get your screen share up and uh, let's get going. And then um, if there's any, you know, questions we can bring up in real time, we will. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll talk some more at the end of the, of the presentation. Awesome. awesome. All right. 
So uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is remastering classic Diablo II Resurrected. Um, I just tried to put as many colons in the title as possible, uh, but as if remastering a classic was a series I was going to do. Uh, but uh, I, a little bit about my point of view. You've already kind of heard a little bit about me already, um, but I've been at VV for over 21 years now. Um, it's now a Blizzard team. Uh, and if we kind of look in the future, you know, I don't know, maybe it's something else. But really, uh, I want to kind of say that not only did I work on um, all those other games, relevant to the talk right now, uh, I got to be part of Crash Bandicoot's Insane Trilogy and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, which were also remakes. Um, and we learned a lot from doing those. And those were actually very, very different types of approaches to what I think some people consider, oh, it's all a remake. You make them the same way. Um, and it's it's really, really very different. Um, I've shipped another a, a bunch of other games. Uh, if anyone ever played Jet Grind Radio on the Game Boy Advance, that was one of my favorite experiences making. Uh, but Guitar Heroes, Skylanders, Destinies. Um, and then, of course, my latest title was Diablo II Resurrected, which is basically what we're going to talk about today. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to kind of talk about remake versus remaster versus reimagining uh what one's right for what you're going to make how you pick one because um those words get thrown around all over the place uh these might not be everyone's definitions they were just my definitions and kind of how i saw it and how we talked about it uh, on the team so a remaster is essentially you're taking the exact same game and you are just making it look like a modern game so in the case of the starcraft remaster it was look now it looks prettier right it's still sprites everything was identical right now the reason why this was the right choice for starcraft was um the bulk of the people still playing starcraft were so hardcore so deep into the every little pixel perfect aspect of it that messing with anything would potentially ruin something or take it away so nothing was changed there other than the art Fun fact, if we had done this to Diablo 2, uh, the sprites alone would have taken like 90 gigs of space. And we we're like, oh, we'll probably have room if we wanted to do that. Um, the next thing is a remake. Now, a remake is what I would call uh, Crash Bandicoot and Tony Hawk, where the engine is rebuilt, right? So Crash Bandicoot's original engine was a proprietary engine by Naughty Dog. Um, we rebuilt it. Same with Tony. Now with Tony, we actually managed to bring some of the original handing code over, some of the original mocap stuff over, so you can port that. With Crash Bandicoot, we actually ended up rotoscoping, so we got the original mesh for the levels laid it on top because that's what was important for that game, like the pixel perfect, uh, even though there weren't pixels, like uh, of the platforming. And for Tony, all the lines need to line up and everything like that. But all of these, uh, even even the StarCraft one, like you have to make it what I'm calling street legal, right? Like to release a game in today's market has to meet certain qualifications. Just like if you were modeling a car and you were taking a Model T that doesn't have rear view mirrors or a license plate, you couldn't put it on the road. So we need to do the bare minimum of some of these things. Uh, and then the last kind of category I put in is the reimagining, right? And this is like, yeah, it's basically whatever we want to do, right? So if you look at Final Fantasy's uh, reimagining, they call it a remake, but like the combat style is completely different, right? Like you're not just picking options from a menu anymore. Um, for example, this is okay here. You're climbing up at the, you know, the cathedral, uh, in one screen, you're still climbing up the cathedral over here, but it's, it's a very different reimagining. I would even go so far as to say that every Zelda game that comes out is a reimagining of the same game. It's like, yep, you're still, this elf guy who's probably got a sword and a shield, and at some point it can reflect stuff, and you end up saving someone, and oh, there's that bad guy over there, probably called Ganon. Like, they're, they're reimaginings of the same story. So which one's right, right? Like, how do you choose uh, where you do it? And at least when we started talking about it, we're like, oh, well, it's a line, right? Like, you got remaster way over here, and you got your reimagining over here. That's great. We'll just kind of put Diablo, like in between closer to the the starcraft side right this is actually a really big deal when it comes to like how you do a game and he's absolutely right you know something like the final fantasy 7 remake is totally not 
a remaster. Um, it's it's something completely different. It's like he said, a reimagining. And the line between you know a a faithful remaster and a reimagining is is very very thin. Um, and if you go too far, the game ceases to be what it was originally. And, uh, and I'm sure he's going to go into detail about this. Um, but that's not actually like how you go about making it, how it really works, because it's really not a line graph. It's actually like a scatter graph. Uh, and not to get super Excel, don't, don't be scared, but different parts of your game, you're going to want to change more or less. So in the example of um, Diablo 2, when it comes to like accessibility, which is this orange dot, like way over here, like that didn't exist. Like colorblind mode, that, that was not even present. Uh, so obviously we wanna make a lot of strides in that area where when it comes to like the meta and the balance, we're not touching that at all, not by a, a fraction of a percent. Uh, same with the narrative, right? The narrative, we rebuilt all of the cutscenes to be gorgeous, but it's shot for shot. It's the same dialogue. It's the same audio track just cleaned up, right? Like the same timing. Um, and so different things kind of came in different. So it doesn't fall neatly on this little graph. Um, so how do you decide what um, what you, you do, what's right for your game? Um, and I think what I'm about to say is not just true for remasters, it's true for every game. <laughs> Who are you making this for? And what do you want? Before you make any game that you at least want to sell to some group of people, or hope not even sell, just give away, like you have to know what they want. Um, so uh, how do you determine what your fan base wants, right? Like the internet's full of opinions, um, but that's not always the best way. Uh, so some examples of why people would want this um, is, they want it for nostalgia. Maybe they want new content for an old game. Maybe they just want to relive the glory days. Maybe they want a whole new take. And who are these people? Are these active people who still play D2R today? Are they lapsed players? People who I played a long time ago, but I've stopped. Are they people who weren't even alive maybe when the game came out, right? Are they diehard fans? Are they fans of the franchise? Like um, those are essentially the questions you have to answer yourself before you kind of do this. Uh, so for Diablo, this was our answers, right? And we gauged this by looking at who we're still playing currently. Like we saw people who literally actively streamed the game every day. Um, and we saw where our numbers were. We saw where our markets were, right? Um, and we also, from what, the want, we, what they wanted, we looked at what people wanted and what they liked with Crash Bandicoot, what they liked with Tony, right? Like, so nostalgia was huge. Like people just wanted to turn on and remember that time they had. Um, they wanted the same gameplay, but they did want it pretty and they did want quality of life things. In fact, there's a lot of things that they didn't know they didn't have. Um, so we had to add them. And some people didn't even know that we added them. They're just like, oh, it's always there. It wasn't really always there. Um, so yeah, you'll notice that the top of the list of who this is for is, is for the passion. Being a parent, especially for the first time, is for the passionate fans. They were the number one group we were making this for. Uh, the next one is current players. And yes, at this time, there are still current people playing D2 before D2R came out. Um, lapsed players are people who played when they were, you know, youths, kids, and they want to come back. And you'll notice that Diablo 3 players is on there, but they're number four, right? We, ha we have to be aware that we probably most of our audience, they're their only exposure to the Diablo world is actually been Diablo 3, at least for the past 10 years, right? So the next thing we need to determine is what was special about the game. A lot of times with remasters, there'll be something that a game is, and the developers are like, oh, we want to we want to get rid of that, or we want to hide that, or we want to sand that edge off. And it's like, no, 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 whatever's special about your game that people keep coming back for, like, one, you should know what it is, and two, you should fight to keep it, and you should elevate it and make it even more of what that thing is, right? Um, oh, yeah, how hard was it to implement the nostalgia button? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it was way easier than you think. Um, well, not for me. I'm not an engineer. It was super easy for me. I just said, yeah, you should make that thing. Um, but, yeah, we'll get into that one. So, yeah, define and embrace what was special about your game. Um so I'm going to give a big warning here. This is a soapbox moment for me. I have a couple of them, but this is probably the biggest one of the whole talk. 
So a true classic game is more than just the game, right? Yes, you have the rules of the game. Yes, you have the art, you have the music, and all of those things are wonderful and they need to work together. But really, it's you can't put the game on a pedestal. If we were to take Diablo 2 and put it on a pedestal and say it is flawless, it is perfect, um, we would never be able to work on it. We couldn't touch it. We couldn't change anything about it, right? And how do you go about improving something that you, you in your mind, are like, well, that's flawless. We can't touch it. So you have to respect it, but you can't keep your game on a pedestal thinking it was perfect because the game was great, not just because of the game, but because of where fans were in their lives. So you have to realize this game came out when it came out, it was one of the best looking games out there. It was a gory action RPG dungeon crawler. There was nothing like it in the world. You have a lot of people who have just gotten computers who are just getting into playing with their friends online. And it's like, it was like right time, right place. So you have all these people who are in really great periods in their life and they are experiencing this game for the first time. And of course, it's amazing to them. Did the designers and developers plan? Like, oh, yeah, it's a good time to come out right now. No, they would just want to make some cool game, right? Um, but we have to respect that it was also a partnership between them and the community, right? It's the union between the game, the developers, and the players, all three of them. And so we have to respect all of them equally. We can't just say the original developers were flawless or the original game is untouchable, right? Like, it's all three of us. So you don't want to lose sight of those players because they just had just as much to do with it becoming a classic as... Um, as the developers. I mean, if you want to like check me on this, think of a, one of your favorite movies as a kid and how much you loved it and then go back and watch it today. Or maybe don't, but it won't be as good as you think it was, right? Because you've now put in your brain how amazing it was because your nostalgia glasses are, you know, they're, they're, they're thick. Okay, soapbox over. So um, looking at there was numerous articles written by the the, the community, uh, articles over time. I mean, this is one of the benefits of a 20-year-old game. We had a lot of people talking about it. Just a, just a quick interjection here. Um, nostalgia glasses. So I am I will be a big proponent that nostalgia glasses do, in fact, exist. And you can definitely be nostalgic for something and then go back and try to experience it. And, uh, and you just feel like it's not quite as good of a game or quite as good as a movie as you thought back then. However, I don't think that's the case with Diablo 2 Resurrected. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I feel like Diablo 2 is one of the very rare situations where the nostalgia actually lived up to the reality. Um, what was it that players found special? Um, so one, they loved the dark, realistic tone, right? Gore, blood, realism. Now, granted, the way that it was kind of shown off in the original game was pretty pixely, but the concept of what it was they loved that right and so we took the approach of if we could make what if the original creators had the tools we had today what would they do and we knew they would go full gore full blood you know full violence so yeah um there was also this concept that the meta was seen as perfect um it wasn't right the game was not perfectly balanced and actually we found out that that was why it was so memorable, right? I don't know if any of you guys have played D2, but if you get to Duriel for the first time, you probably died. You probably died a lot, like a real lot. And that's not because that fight is perfectly tuned. That fight just smacks you in the face and you have to leave and fail and figure out a way to change your build or to level up your character to come back. And by doing that, you learn about it. Um, and so... That wasn't perfect, but that imperfection made it so great, right? Those rough edges make it memorable. They make it really good. Um, and these kind of, hey, wouldn't it be neat if gear things over the years, like people have just come up with these awesome ways to make it. So, um, but we did have to realize that people saw the game's meta as perfect. Um, the other thing was there were no right answers, right? Like if you played other uh, RPGs, especially modern ones, you get a piece of gear and you're like, oh, it has strength on it. That's for that class. Or, oh, it has intelligence, it's for the caster. Um, the fact that I could roll a barbarian who takes a belt that lets him teleport or can turn into a bear, it's like, no, you literally can do whatever you want in this game. Um, and we're just going to let you play that way. Um, that was really awesome, right? Letting people do what they wanted. Um, and even into the point where uh, players 
yes, hammer dins are perfectly balanced. Fight me for that. Um, so, uh, for example, if you play D3, when you get a piece of gear, there is an arrow. An arrow, a green arrow will point up, a red arrow will point down. Um, those aren't actually always honest. Uh, and we had a request early on to add those arrows to D2. So he's talking about the uh, the gear suggestion arrows, and uh, and they're terrible in my opinion. Um, they give you a false idea of what is better or worse than a piece of equipment that you have on, and uh, fundamentally they're actually usually wrong, um, unless it's just like a straight up scenario of oh look this piece of armor has twelve strength and that piece of armor has thirteen or fourteen strength. And in Diablo 3, it makes a little bit more sense because in Diablo 3, there are like direct upgrades like that where you can just like find an item which is just slightly better than the one that you had previous. But uh, even in Diablo 3, when you get into the fine tuning of your character, when you get into the end game meta, um, those little green arrows mean absolutely nothing. And, um, and honestly, if they had put them in Diablo 2, it would have been a horrible mistake. Um, and, uh, we couldn't do it because if we did, it would have to take so many variables into account. Um, it, uh, the best way I could explain is if you've ever played World of Warcraft, you know that there are items that are trinkets, right? So most gear is like plus, plus five to this, plus 10 to this, whatever. And a trinket is like, on chance of attack, you summon three wolves. And it's like, well, how do you put an arrow next to chance of summoning three wolves, right? You can't. And that's really kind of what all the gear is like in D2. Um, and so that was a um, uh, a thing where we're like, nope, we're not even going to tell you. It's up to the players to learn how the game works. But we did add a panel that told way more stats than the original game did. Because most of the stuff in the original game that the game didn't even tell you, like the community figured it out because they just sifted through the code. Um, so yeah, that was a big thing. Uh, and then the sense of discovery, right? There was no dot that appeared on the map that said, hey, go here, right? A lot of people were like, where do I go? And we're like, the quest tells you, go find someone in the desert. So just start looking in the desert. Um, and it took a little while for people to get used to that. But this whole like, no, like you got to figure it out. You got to pay attention. Um, people liked, right? It actually worked. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I'm, I've always been a big proponent of let the person figure it out. Um, we don't need quest icons. We don't need arrows pointing us in the direction. Um, I was playing a game recently, literally had footsteps to the direction. I'm pretty sure it was Diablo Immortal. Like, literally, it's so brain-dead gameplay that you don't even have to pay attention to what you're doing. You don't have to read any of the dialogue. You don't have to look at any of the quests. You don't have to watch any of the cutscenes. All you do is follow the little arrow and follow the little footsteps, and it leads you to objective and objective and objective and objective. And uh, Diablo 2 doesn't do that. Diablo 2 doesn't. It's like, hey, you know, go talk to, to you know, go find Cain. Where, where's Cain at? And you got to go, like, go, go to the Tree of Infus. You got to get the scroll. You got to bring it to a car. A car tells you to go take it to the stones. You go into the stones. Cain's in, in a freaking cage inside the uh, burning Tristram. You rescue Cain. You know, there's there's all sorts of really cool things that go on. And, and the game doesn't point you in any other direction of that stuff. And I freaking love it. And I wish more games would embrace that because we don't need to have our hands held. Like we're not little babies. Like let us figure things out, you know, like put a, put a problem in front of us without immediately giving us the answer after five seconds. Um, oh, and then lastly, quirks. People loved some of the quirks. Um, things that are considered broken really weren't broken, like um, because it just kind of became part of what the game was even though it is a little quirky. Um, so we took on the role of like caretakers of the game. Um, and there's a lot of pressures and challenging when you when you kind of are entrusted with people's childhood, because that's really what we were. Um, we had to remaster the original game without damaging the original game, right? Like we couldn't make the game worse. If we're gonna go bother to remaster this thing, uh, it needs to be worth people's time. It needs to be worth people's money. It needs to be worth them coming back and taking a like, second go and look and not just being like, yeah, I already played that. Why are you showing me again, right? <laughs> so you guys don't know why I'm laughing, but I've seen this news article before. So there was this like famous painting of Jesus Christ. Uh, I can't remember. It was in some monastery or something. 
Um, the details aren't super important, but basically what happened was one of the, like, nuns or something decided that they were going to take it upon themselves to, uh, to fix the painting, to basically go over it and to, to fill in the missing pieces and restore it back to its original, you know, greatness. And the picture that he has up here is literally, on the left side is the original, and on the right side is the one that the nun basically finished with, uh, overwriting the original work. And, and this is so apt for video game remasters, because literally the original was still in good shape. Like it wasn't a horrible painting. Yes, it had some pieces that had fallen off and it probably could have used a little love to restore it to its original value, its original, its original, uh, you know, amazingness. But what she created as a result from it was literally hot garbage and it's just absolutely terrible. And, uh, and you don't want to do more harm to the game um, you know, than, 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 uh, than the, than the original, like you don't want your little, your literally your remaster to end up being worse than the original game. And it couldn't just be because, oh, it's really pretty now. Right. Um, so this was something we had to be very, very careful with. Um, but 20 years is a very long time, like a really long time when it comes to video games, you've gone through numerous game systems. Um, like we're on very high numbers of PlayStations. We're on umpteen million handheld versions of Nintendo. Um, lots happens in this industry. Uh, VR is a thing, augmented reality is a thing, everything is online, right? Um, so we had to keep the same game, but we couldn't ignore the fact that the entire world has kind of moved along without it, right? So for Diablo, um, there's a lot of things that we had to be mindful of, right? Like how people play games now is just different, right? Like you have lots to choose from. Um, you you have a shorter attention span. You're used to certain quality of life features. Um, how people connect, right? We're not like, yes, we're not dialing up on AOL. We're not like hanging up the phone real quick and hoping no one picks it up when we're trying to go fight bail, right? Dude, he's freaking cracking me up with these images because he's like spot on. I can't count how many times I, I literally dialed up to AOL so I could play some Diablo 2. Like, that was literally the service that I used at that time. Um, techno just te technology in general has changed. Um, we also have way more requirements and standards, right? So uh, you, if you're going to have user-generated content, like let this player name their item and share it with other players, like there is a litany of of standards and regulations you don't have to go through not just because you have nintendo and you know microsoft and everything like that but you have all the countries in the world that have different things right like this game comes out all over the world it's a global game right um and then lastly we just have way more awareness of people who can play people who want to play and things we can do to help people who couldn't play before right and i'm not just talking about like colorblind mode or low vision mode, but like there are temporary disabilities. Like I have a baby now, so I need to be able to change the volume or be able to play with one hand. Like these are all things that are really awesome to let more people play. And we just, nobody ever thought about that back in the day, right? Um, and so we just know more about that. Um, so we used pillars and process to kind of determine how we were gonna change this game, right? Because we are changing it, right? Um, most of these things we saw as improvements, but some of them we had to change just to actually, you know, have it shipped, right? Uh, and so we needed a, a guideline um, for how we changed stuff, right? So how do we go about doing that? Well, first, um, for all the audio and visual and visuals, we use the 70-30. And uh, this is a fancy term of saying we stuck with it 70% of the time and 30% and 30, 30 was new stuff. Um, but it was really more of like, at a split second, you should be able to look at it and be like, oh, I know exactly what that is, right? Like, um, we we first started with some of the monsters, we made them too divergent. And what would happen is, or people who played the game, like, religiously, would look at it, and they wouldn't know what it was. They would have to spend a couple seconds being like, wait, what monster is that? Oh, it's that monster. And we couldn't have that. We had to keep the silhouette the same. We had to keep the color tones the same. Uh, all of those things were really important to keep them, you know, together. Um, the next thing is we definitely wanted to keep it dark tonally. We couldn't brighten it up, cartoon it up or anything like that. Uh, this was a big deal. It was realism was like a huge thing for us. Um, and, the, and overall, the game needed to feel the same. And this is a really squishy one, but we knew it when we got it wrong. 
right? Like we knew when the game didn't feel the same way. And there's a lot of things under the hood that would change feel. And it wasn't just data. It wasn't just numbers. It was also how stuff looked, how stuff sounded. Um, because like, you know, when a monster dies and all of the loot comes out of it, there's a lot going on. Um, how those items are spaced, how they sound, right? Like, and so all of those things working together create a feel. And when you start messing with all those little things independently, it can run that risk. So um, yes, there were no rainbows in this Diablo. Um, uh, and we also did want to make this game uh, easier to play, but not easier. And this was another big thing. We, we weren't going to make this game easy for people, right? It was a hard game. We're going to keep it being a hard game, but we wanted to make it more accessible to play, right? So letting it run on your the monitor that you needed or making it easier for you to connect, those were good things. But saying, ah, you know what? We're going to make Duriel deal less damage. It's like, no, we're not making it easier because like the game was hard and you died a lot. It's like, yep, the game's hard. Like even we, we even started having conversations about like, hey, well, it's really hard to respect. Should we like add a way to respect more? And we're like, no, that's not making it more accessible to anyone. That's just making it easier for people. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then lastly, and probably the hardest one is we're making what players remember not what it really was. Um, to the point where we actually had some reviewers come on early on and take a look at the game and we had it in like the super fancy mode and they're like, oh yeah, it looks pretty good. And then we're like, hey, hey, hit the G key and they would hit it and it would go back to the old version. And they were like, oh God, did it really look that way? And we're like, yep, really looked at it. We're like, holy, <laughs> like, cause to see it literally side by side um, was a real shocker, right? People don't actually remember what it looks like. I love that, by the way. All right. um, oh, and lastly, we did want it to be a safer, more secure game. We knew that botting, we knew that item duping, and all of those things, like, they just kind of ruined the game for a lot of people. Um, this was a big thing, and I, and I did see a question about modders. Like, this was one of the choices we had. We were like, do we, do we keep the game as unsecure as it is, but allow people to mod the game a lot? Or do we, like, stick with what it is? Like, and it was like, no, we, like, by allowing people to literally hack everything, um, that that's going to ruin it for more of our people. But what we did do is we still allowed an offline mode and we still um, let, like, because at this point, we know you can hack your offline mode. Um, in fact, if I think if you take your old D2 save file and drop it in your D2R save file folder, it has a pretty good chance of just working like a 20 year old save file. You won't be able to go backwards the other way. Um, but it does kind of work, but because it's, it's like it's offline, we don't care. But all the online games, those we really want to make safer and more secure. Okay, so how did we go about applying these rules to our pillars? Um, so first, uh, someone asked the question, how hard was it to actually do uh, 2D on top of 3D? Um, and as you can see right here in this video, like it just works, right? And that was a really big deal. We wanted it to just work. Um, and so the uh trick is they're both running all the time right like we actually are having both games run all the time and that's because the logic of the entire game is still the old 2d game um in fact that was that was an idea we had pretty early on because we were talking about how do we rebuild this how do we make it and we had the humility the humility to know yeah there's no way we're going to recreate every little nuanced thing so we're like let's just keep the old game but have it tell the 3d thing how to run and so when you see your barbarian run and swing its sword, there's no 3D algorithm checking it. It's just like, hey, old game, did it hit? Yes, okay, cool. We'll play this nice new fancy VFX. So they're actually both running all the time, um, which is why we can just turn one render panel off and one on, and then you go there, you see it. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so the other thing is we did fully overhaul the front end. Uh, if you remember the old front end, you were greeted with like, old battle net new battle net open battle net like things people didn't understand yes we did lose tcp ip uh however as sad as that is almost 95 percent of people would be like i don't even know what that means what is that for um and so we took a much more modern approach where we could take our character put them big front and center we could make the play button be the thing you do um because we also wanted this to be usable with the controller um and actually, the controller on PC is different than console, even though they both use a controller. It's a whole new UI. Um, but yeah, this helped us kind of just make the game look more modern right in the beginning. This is why uh, you can't do the graphics toggle in the front end. You actually used to for a long time, and it was just 
they started becoming so divergent you couldn't do it uh with the exception of the fire flight can't can, the campfire we had to keep that there's actually a little button somewhere you can click and it'll it'll let you change it um and then lastly we did do some selective quality of life things so this at the first was very very light touch uh, so as you can see here we actually added an advanced stats page like all of this data used to never be shown to the player um and now we're just like yeah here it is oh and it's actually accurate by the way because it used to not be uh that accurate at all actually um so why did we keep the old code okay um it's not just we want to make sure we got it right it's also and this is where i get a little softy it's a little bit of archaeology and preservation right like this is a piece of gaming history and we didn't just want to literally you know rip out the foundation of the sistine chapel and be like yeah it can be steel we'll throw that in there right like we wanted to preserve something of what the original game was um and so we were opening the black box right like we wanted to see what the feel was and so we looked into a like we looked into a lot of what made this game tick and it it was made like a game you would expect made 20 plus years ago there's a lot of baylor tie twine and spit and tons of stuff left over from d1 um there was actually some really cool stuff like your gear knows what time of day it is because they were thinking of having items that only worked at night and uh, and your light radius used to matter in d1 it was actually the aggro radius and players would make builds where they had no light radius and they play stealth they just commented that out for d2 but it's still in the engine right that's really interesting um, I'm actually really, really glad, honestly, that they went with that, that they that they kept the original engine, because I think that's one of the reasons why Diablo II Resurrected has succeeded so well, is because they kept the original, um, you know, running underneath. Um, and so kind of opening this box and seeing how everything worked was, was very eye-opening, but also was like, we wanted to respect the archaeology, keep it there, right? Um, yes, the old code totally makes it difficult to add or change features. Um, it just means we have to educate ourselves and learn a lot lot more about how it works. Um, but it's not as bad as you think. Like, it's still a solid game. Like, the code still has been running for 20 plus years. Like, it might be old, but it's like an old castle, right? Like, it's still gonna survive a cannon blast. Like, it's pretty good. Um, so yeah, so there's this thing called provenance, right? Uh, it's a big fancy word I use to sound fancy, but really it's just knowing where something came from. Um, and so, I'm gonna use a car reference, apologize if you aren't car people. Um, but this is an original Shelby Cobra. Now there's only a handful of these things left in the world, all right? Uh, and this is a factory five kit car. Um, they look pretty darn similar. If you're not a car person, you'd probably even think the one on the right is nicer because, hey, look, it's got a stripe. Um, but in actuality, the one on the left sold for the record breaking value of, a of an old car at almost $14 million. And you can get the one on the right for like 40 to 60 K, which I also still can't afford, but would love that one. I could totally get that one. And it's because it's not the real thing, right? It's not what, what it actually was, right? And that's important. But then you're like, well, why, why does that even matter? This is a digital product. Who the hell cares? It's all O's and ones. I could just copy it and it's the same thing. Yes and no. Once again, as I said before, like 20 years is a long time. And games are not like a board game, right? Like, it's not like I could, like, in 50 years, I could take one of these board games off the shelf and be like, look, all the pieces are still there. We can totally play the exact same game. Computer games are played on computers with technology, like that, that is tied to many, many other things. And so it is not an isolated product. Even 20 years ago, it's not an isolated product, right? Uh, it's online, you have networks and all that. So like to compare it, you look at the typewriter, right? A typewriter still works, but good luck trying to find ink for that typewriter when it runs out, right? Like a gramophone still works, but like you can't really get oh those little wax cylinders. I mean, this one's a record. You can get records now. That's they're making a comeback, but they advanced, right? Um, and a fax machine, right? Like fax machines are great, but even if you have a perfectly working fax machine, it's useless unless all your other friends have fax machines, right? Because it belongs to a network, right? I expect gas stations to go the same way, right? Like, it's like gas is great because it's everywhere. I can literally throw a rock and hit a gas station. Um, but like, yeah, you're right. Fa fax machines are not great. Uh, although for some reason, I still need them to like sign important documents. I'm like, can I just do it? Anyway, 
so yeah, but now we start looking at like, okay, there's WoW Classic. WoW Classic is not the same as Vanilla WoW. There, there were differences, right? Um, do you still have Sound Blaster on your machine? Because if you don't, you can't run like almost all games made in the early 90s, right? <laughs> like uh, even Destiny 2, which is a live game, like there are certain planets that they just stop supporting, right? Because their engine improves, it starts costing money to keep supporting all of that old content. Um, and so you have to modernize some of your stuff. Now, if you guys see this little icon in the corner, little teeny dark wanderer, uh, these are new slides added only for this talk, right? So I did this talk for GDC, but I had to add more content for you guys because they're so special. Um, and so keep an eye out for them. But I want to get into a little bit of the required monetization. And hopefully this kind of drives the nail home. So like the first thing is frame rate, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, and the second one is aspect ratios for screens. Um, so getting into frame rate, if you don't know, Diablo 2 uh, ran at 25 frames per second. And not only did the game run at 25 frames per second, the logic of the game ran at 25 frames per second. Um, and so, what am I doing? Do, 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 do. Yeah, nah, whatever. Um, sorry, distracted. People yelling at me that I'm saying something NDA breaking. I'm not, don't worry. Um, so either way, the logic runs at 25 frames per second, which means that if you ever had a piece of gear that would impact your stats less than 4% of a second, you couldn't see it, right? Because the game is only going to show you every 25th of a second. And if you have something that says, hey, we're going to increase your attack rate by 2% of a second, you won't see it. And so what the community referred to is as breakpoints, where it's like, hey, look, at a certain point, you need to have enough stats in something to hit that next frame for it to even matter, right? So whether or not that's good or bad, that's just how the old game was, and that's how the old game felt, and you ha we have to keep the, the, the feeling there. Well, here's the thing. In a modern game, if I have some godly machine, I want to let my fans run this game at 120 frames per second if they want, basically uncapped frame rate. So how do you do that, right? So the the change we made is the server and the game logic still runs at 25 frames per second, but all of our animations can operate fully independent of that. Um, another way I've explained it is if you took a bike wheel, right, and you spin a bike wheel, a wheel essentially have, has infinite sides. Now, if we say that there are 25 spokes on the bike wheel and you spin it at a regular rate, okay, you're always going to hit those spokes, but I could make the wheel infinitely smooth. And it's still always going to have a spoke every 25 frames. And so that's kind of how we approached all the animation in the game. And that was actually a pretty risky overhaul. Um, but we were really rigorous with testing. And we actually caught a couple couple bugs. But in the end, we, we solved it. We cracked it. Game feels the same, but it looks really, really pretty now. Um, so on to the aspect ratio. Um, the old game was four by three, right? Like basic TV. Uh, if you've ever heard of something called a safe frame, a safe frame is a window with inside your screen where you should put text. And this is because old screens curved, right? They had a tube. And so you couldn't even put like your HUD and other things had to be high enough so they didn't curve so you didn't see it. Obviously, we don't care about any of that right now, but that's how the old game was. Modern games all have to run in 16 by 9. And enthusiasts have like 21 by 9 screens. And so it's like, okay, well, we can show that, but the game wasn't even really built to do that, right? Uh, and forgive some of these uh, screenshots, but like, here's the old game. Here's the new game. The big thing is there's like way more on the sides of the screen, right? So even if we ignore that, okay, you're, you're, you're getting more like, uh, you're using more of your monitor, like you can see more game, right? You can now see monsters before when you couldn't, right? So interesting um, add on to what he's saying here. And I feel like this is, is really prudent. In the old days, I don't know if you guys remember, we would watch a movie and the movie would say, this movie has been formatted for your 4x3 screen or whatever, right? Well, in the old days, the movies were shot in 16x9 or whatever the, the film you know camera that they were using was. And when they formatted it for the smaller screens, it was literally cutting off 
part of the, of the movie. You were literally missing part of the movie that was originally shot. Um, they would literally just slice off the edge, slice off the edge, and turn it into a smaller image. And um, it's not quite the same way with Diablo 2 Resurrected. You know, we never could see that part of the movie before. Um, but, uh, but now that it is widescreen, we can now see that part of the movie. Um, if you've ever watched an old movie in 4x3 and you have a chance, watch it in 16x9. Um, because the 16x9 version, um, if you can find a widescreen version, has more content. So your favorite movie that you watched in 4x3, in, in you missed out on the edges of the film and there are things on the edges of the film that the director intended for you to see that you're not going to be able to see in the 4x3 version you can now see other players before when you couldn't um and this was very very controversial so the first concern was will it even work and so at first we actually made the game 21 by 9 and it all didn't break but monsters stopped doing things at 19 inches so we actually bring in black back bars. We actually decorated them. So if you have a crazy monitor. So we support 19 by 9, which is totally weird. But it was the, the number we found where we're like, look, this is literally the most we can show of the game. Um, and we did get in discussions about like, well, what about PVP, right? Like I, I have a 21 by 9 monitor and you still have a rinky dink monitor. And I can see you before you can see me. And that was one of those things was like, well, yeah, but... The player paid for that, right? You 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 go and you invest in a twenty one by nine monitor. Like, good on you, right? Like, you we want you to enjoy the the stuff that you've gotten. Um, and so that was a tricky thing. Where it's like, how yeah, how far out can we get before the monsters just literally stop aggroing you? Um, so yeah, I mean, I do know some people ran the mod so you can see all the way out. Um, the biggest problem also is streaming, right? So a sorceress can teleport wherever she can click. Uh, in fact, all characters, not just the sorcerers, can teleport wherever they can click. Um, and if you can click on the edge of the screen and the edge of your screen is even further away than it used to be, you can now travel even faster, which would start to break speedrunner records. Um, so in that case, we actually have you teleport in the same direction where you click, but we stop you where you used to stop. So that one we, we at least caught. Um, okay, so back to the stuff that's not as... I did not know that. I did not know that. So apparently the uh, widescreen advantage for teleporting does not exist. He basically just said that when you teleport to the edge of the screen, it stops you where you would have normally stopped. So you're not teleporting to the edge of the screen like you think you are. So having a widescreen monitor or having an ultra widescreen monitor does not offer you an advantage over another player who does not have one. That is very interesting was exclusive to you guys um another big topic we hit was like bugs we're like okay well the old game had bugs and since we're using the original code we have the original bugs so do we fix some of these bugs uh, and some of these bugs were like long time bugs that the community wanted fixed and they had opinions and everything like that so the one i'm going to talk about is actually like a very tricky one because um We'll get to that in a second. So some of the, the more common ones, like how to dupe items, how to make box, how to speed runs, like the, 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 the internet knew how to break our game, right? Like, absolutely. They knew how to break our game. Uh, in fact, I think when we did our tech alpha for the, the world, like it was cracked in like five minutes because it's like, oh, hey, all of these things that we've had to hack the game. Yeah, they, they all still work because it's all still, still the same old code, right? So we knew about those problems and those bugs needed to be fixed. Um, but there's another bug that is near and dear to my heart because uh, it came up an awful lot. Um, and it's called the next hit always misses bug. Uh, and what was really interesting is that what the real bug was, was not what players thought the bug was. So what they wanted fixed wasn't even a thing. So come along with me for a little ride for a second. So what the players thought was happening is that there was a glitch that said um, you would cast an attack, and if you did another attack immediately after it, uh, it would always miss, right? And they're like, it's a bug, right? Like, I, I've started my animation and nothing happened. Uh, and they're like, yeah, the next hit, if I do it really quickly, won't happen. That's not what's really going on. So one of the things you have to realize with Diablo 2 is that there's always been a server-client relationship. Even when you play the game by yourself, offline, the game still simulates a server-client relationship. Um, 
it's just how everything was built. It was all built to be online. And then they're just like, yeah, you got the server on your computer when you play offline. So for to, to, to dumb this down even further, what he's talking about is desync. It's the process by which your computer, essentially, or your game is desynced from the server client uh, so the, the server and the client are in two completely different situations. So, the you know, the, your client thinks you're over here, but the server knows you're, like, right here, which is a slightly different place, but uh, the server is the one that matters, not the client. So at the end of the day, if the server says that you're two more, four, you know, inches over to the left, then that's where you're standing, um, and your client is unfortunately wrong. And so what, what actually happens is that um, let's say you're going to cast a spell. Right? So casting a spell it requires an animation. So you're going and you're going to cast a spell. And on this little timeline here, you cast a spell. And in a certain frame in that spell, the fireball. Right. And so that's what we'll call the attack frame. Maybe it's frame six, whatever you want to call it. So uh, as a player, I hit the button and I say I'm casting a spell. And on the server um, and the client, both those things happen. I'm starting to cast the thing. Well. Before I get to that attack frame, my character gets hit. I take a hit, right? Oh no, I've taken a hit. Well, I'm now playing a take hit animation, right? I got knocked out of my spell before I could finish casting it. Monster hit me. Now I'm reeling from the take hit. So the game is like, well, yeah, you're going to play your take hit and then you'll eventually return back to idle. Well, what was happening was uh, you could desync your client to start casting another spell. You could basically interrupt out of your take hit to do another thing. Now, if you don't know what a desync is, a desync is essentially what the server thinks is happening is different than what the client thinks is happening. The most common desync you'll see is something called rubber banding, which is I'm running and then I get snapped back to another spot. And that's because where the server thinks you are and where your client thinks you are are not in the same spot. So they fix you. They force you to go back to where you were. And you'll notice like if your ping gets really low or your connection is weak, you'll you'll rubber band a lot more. That's just how it worked. Well, they the, the community was desyncing their game when they got a hit to break into another animation. So what's really happening is the server is like, well, you got hit. You, you're going to finish taking your hit. But what the players would see is, oh, look, I'm casting a new spell. So they would cast the new spell, they would get to the attack frame, and the attack frame would go off, and they'd see all the cool spell effects. And they'd be like, cool, well, great, I made the attack. And it would go up to the up to the server, and the server's like, eh, no, you're still taking a hit. You miss everything, and we're not going to tell you about it, right? And so, yes, there was a lot of abuse of desync and PvP. And so we're like, okay, well, what do we do in this case? Because what there's no... The, the thing that's actually broken is the desync part. Um, and so what we did was we went back to our pillars and we say, okay, we want to make this the game people remember, um, which they're clearly remembering, they're remembering it, but they're interpreting it inaccurately. The game needs to feel the same. And we also want to save for more secure game. So what we did was we actually turned off the desync, which made the game feel the same way. Even if you didn't, if you, if you didn't look at it, because what was happening in the end was still always the same. In fact, we didn't change any of the server code at all. But from the client side, we were just actually telling you the truth now, um, which was perceived to the community. It was like, oh, we nerfed things. And it's like, no, we in no way have given you more attacks or taken attacks away. We're just letting it be honest. Um, but one thing we had to do huge was we had to do like blog posts, forum posts, talks about what we were doing. And even then, there was a thing that we didn't actually tell people, and that's that whether you're online or offline, you still have a client server relationship. Um, and some people are like, well, then why does it still do it offline? And we're like, we didn't tell you that part, but yeah. So a little bit of a fix um, for or for what he's talking about here, because if we if we look objectively at it, it's a little bit more than just simply showing you the uh, the right information. So the next hit always misses bug. It could actually force you into a situation where you would miss more attacks than you otherwise normally would um so uh, according to his own timeline when you when you take the hit you have to wait the appropriate animation time before the hit is finished but the problem is is that if you had started a ability during the process when you were supposed to still be hit and the ability's cast time or whatever or delay was longer than the hit that you took it could often cause you to miss um, more than one ability. 
Um, sometimes it could actually cause you to hit to miss twice, or it could delay you further than the hit was actually intended you to delay. Like say, for instance, um, you uh, needed to be delayed four tenth, four twenty fifths of a second for the hit delay or whatever. Um, and the spell casting started at the second frame of the hit delay and didn't finish until the until after the hit delay was already over. Because the spell started during the hit delay, um, you would essentially not cast the ability, and you would also not be able to cast another ability further past the hit delay because you were still under the delay of the first ability. In other words, you could essentially make your hit delay even worse by casting or desyncing essentially at the wrong moment, which would increase the delay of the hit even further because of the stupid spell delay. Um, and the client thinks it's doing the right thing by giving you this delay, but the server is like, no, you were supposed to be able to cast, you know, you know, two, two uh, 20 fifths of a second ago, um, you know, but that was your fault because you were in the middle of casting Meteor when you weren't supposed to be. And so we had to tell you that that was a miss, but, um, you know, good luck. So that was an interesting one. That one, I think we kind of did middle of the road. I wouldn't say we knocked it out of the park. I wouldn't say we did horrible, but that's how we kind of hit it. So... Another thing was how do we add quality of life, right? Um, and so the original game had a whole bunch of features that players forgot they didn't even have, but now they expect those features, right? So what they remembered is the game was amazing and they played with their friends and they earned everything because the game was hard and that anything clunky was just the game having character, right? Their meta was perfect. But things that like every player forgot was, oh yeah, there's stamina. Like when I if I run too long, I stop. And when I'm running, I lose armor, right? Um, finding a game with friends was hard, like having to manage your scrolls, like, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have that identified. Go talk to the old man in town or use a scroll, right? Um, do you want to respec? Cool. You get one. Good luck. Um, and the game's not going to teach you anything. Uh, and that the game is not balanced. Everyone forgot that the game, once again, is not balanced. And that's actually okay. It's not a bad thing. I'm not knocking it. Um, and so controller support was like a huge thing right not only because we want our game to come out on console but just a lot of players play on controller now and so we're like okay cool we want to bring controller but like the game never had controller right so how do we even know if the game feels the same because there never was a game with a controller and yes people will tell me that playstation had you know diablo one no it's not the same that was bad go play it on a controller um so we're like no we have to figure out how to do this so this is another area where i gave you guys even more content so um the amount of things that changed that we had to do to get controller to work was bonkers and in fact i even tried to do a talk at gdc just about controller and gdc was like well eh, we don't think enough there would be enough interest i'm like what that's all right fine so i'm going to talk to you guys more about it just because i love geeking out about it but i can't even get to all of these things uh, I'm going to add one more thing, and that's the player shift role. But mostly I'm going to focus on these four things. Um, what your role is, uh, moving, targeting, and looting, which are kind of the biggest parts. Uh, I'm not going to talk about inventory management. Like, we went through so many iterations of trying to get your inventory to work with a controller, um, trying things like a list, trying things more like a D3 approach. All of them worked. None of them felt like Diablo 2. Turns out, inner, it, like, Inventory Tetris is one of those things that just feels like D2. So we just tried to make it as good as we could with a controller mount. Um, player to player communication, whole other thing. You don't have a keyboard when you're playing on a console. Uh, and bringing up a virtual keyboard on a controller is poo. Um, and lastly, the whole UI UX interface is a whole other thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So jumping in, uh, the role shift. So this one is a doozy. Um, from a principles level, not necessarily from a like the work we had to do. And the biggest thing is that when you are playing with a mouse and keyboard, you are taking on the role of kind of an eye in the sky, right? Just like you would in old school SimCity. You are a god telling your pet what to do. Run over here, go shoot this thing, go click this monster, right? When you are a controller, like you are your character right? There is no, hey, go over here, right? Um, and so that was just a big mental shift of how you're actually playing the role. Like changing the role 
it really impacts the feel of it. So we had to respect that. Because of that, it affects movement, right? So you got to remember that Diablo is legit inspired by tabletop games. It is on a grid. Um, in fact, uh, we were even talking before this talk, like the game used to be turn-based, right? And so everything is done on a grid. In fact, there's literally like a grid running underneath. So if you see, this is the grid, right? And if you look at this, you see this little white line, that's the controller uh, thumbstick uh, deviation. But you'll see a lot of random squares, right? Just squares floating off in, into nothingness. Some of them have a rock. Some of them have nothing. And what, what kind of is interesting about that is you never noticed it in the old game. And that's because when you would click somewhere in the old game, the game pathed there for you, right? Um, and because the game path there for you, if it had to walk around a rock, it would just walk around a rock. Um, when you have a controller stick, you can push it wherever you want. You can literally find that thing. You can also run into a wall. There's no way to run into a wall with a controller and, or with a keyboard and mouse. If you click a, in a zone you can't get to, your character just says, I can't go there, right? Um, and so we had to reinvent like what walking was, what like running was, because stamina was a whole thing. Um, and yes, we thought of getting rid of it and no, we couldn't. Um, and so this was like a huge deal because we also weren't going to change the original collision, right? Like the original collision was what it was. We weren't changing it. Um, so movement was a huge deal. Um, next was looting items. So here's the deal. Everyone pretty much loots items by clicking on the name, right? If, you're, if your pinky was not on the button that just showed and hid item names like that's just kind of what it was uh like you just click on the thing when you don't have a cursor you can't do that so you use your character to walk on top of it and so the first thing we did here was uh one you'll notice that my character can actually walk really really slow this helped with just picking up that one thing um yeah, you'll notice I'm trolling you guys because I literally just walk around the Zod. Um, so like uh, adding to the granularity of how delicate you could, because once again, it's not a game with infinite uh, like inventory space. You don't just like pick up everything. It's like, I've got four squares and I'm going to pick up one thing. I got to make sure it's the right thing I want to pick up. The other thing we did was, and this was actually probably, and probably still is one of the most controversial things we did, is we adjusted the item spacing. And so when items spawn, because they're dropped or because you throw them on the ground, they will look for empty spots in the world and they'll all appear there, right? And you can fill the whole screen up with trash. Um, well, the spacing that they try to space themselves out, we increased. And that's why if you actually go to a game creation settings, you'll see this one odd setting of like item spacing controller or like, and I think we call it like resurrected and original. Um, but it's to help you use the controller. Now, most players Dad? didn't even care, but it was a little bit of a, of a change, right? And we had to put it on the game setting because there is no such thing as personal loot in D2. If the item drops in the world for you and for me, it's in the same spot for both of us, right? And so that was like a little thing we had to do to actually make it feasible to just pick up that one item you really wanted. Um, and then lastly, at least the thing I'm going to talk about is targeting monsters. Now, once again, I said there was no cursor with a controller. And so what we actually use is we use tech that we used back in Skylanders. And by the way, Skylanders was just Diablo for kids. That was totally like our mission statement. Um, you have a cone in front of your character and that cone has two numbers that they weight. One is distance to the player, right? How far away they are. And the other is how close to being in front of you. And so if something is very, very in front of you, that's good for long range stuff. You can snipe that one character back there. If something's very close to you, it's best used for melee attacks. The problem is, is that in Diablo, you can have at your disposal one of like 20 some odd abilities at any time. So we had to kind of keep these things generic. And in the end, we actually dumbed it down to three groups and it's just based on your class. There's basically a ranged class, a melee class, and a in-between class. Um, and that tweaks the rating. So that means that if you, you know, build your gear such that your barbarian can throw fireballs, your fireballs actually aim differently when thrown from a barbarian than they do from a sorceress. Um, but on top of that, uh, because there was no cursor, you'll notice we moved the health bar above the monster you have selected rather than keeping it on top of the screen. And that helped knowing at least who you were aiming at because the slight brightness change was not enough to read it. 
So, yep, per class. It's kind of not like we just kind of put the classes in buckets. Um, so, yeah, so that's the controller stuff. Uh, overall, I actually think we did a really, really good job on this. Super proud of this. Most like we knew we won when diehard fans were like, well, I guess I don't hate it. And we're like, we won. Like, um, and in fact, we even had big requests for controller features back on keyboard and mouse, right? So the quick bar, um, that was because people liked how it worked on the controller. Because if you got to remember on a keyboard and mouse, you're not actually having a, a tray of abilities to use. You literally have two, right? Click and left click. But all your hotkeys are remapping what those two buttons do. And so you're basically frantically remapping your buttons all the time. Whereas with a controller, it's like, yeah, you've got eight buttons, nine buttons, 12 buttons when you hit the alt button. Like you just hit them whatever you want. You hit it and it does it. Um, and so we added like the quick launch bar, which was like added on later on um, because the community just was like, we really like this. I'm like, okay, well, that's a win. Um, now, the last one is something that if you are still playing D2R, and I hope you are, uh, there'll be something fun coming up. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to let our community manager talk about that. Um, but it was something that originally we did not do very, very well. Um, and that is our console game finder. Now, the way that you play with other people in old school D2 is the lobby, right? Um, and look, you can type and players make their own games and rules are wild west. You do whatever you want, right? Make a game, call it looking to trade Zod Rune and people would find your game, right? Um, the problem is that like with a console, like typing is dumb. Right, like if you've ever tried to type with uh, like an actual controller in any speed, let alone in a chat room when things are flying past and half of them are ads, like you can't do it. It's just not possible, right? Uh, also, communicating with strangers is not only hard to do, but it's restricted, right? Like especially if you're on certain platforms, they just have rules about who you can talk to and if they're your friends and other things like that. Um, UGC, so user generated content, like those rules vary across all countries, everything like that. Uh, but it's fundamentally a different play style, right? Like the whole basis of I'm going to spin up a server, then I'm going to tell people about my server, then I'm going to be in that game, and then people are going to join that game, and then I'm going to invite them to the party is backwards from how a console player plays. A console player is like, oh, friends list, invite, invite, invite. Cool. We're in a party. Now I'm going to play the game, and we all join in together. We couldn't, we actually tried, but we cannot fundamentally change the way, like we couldn't have out of game parties. Like that wasn't even a thing that was possible. Um, and so we're like, okay, how are we going to crack this nut? People can't talk, people can't type, other things like that. So what we proposed to do is we said, look, we know that there's a whole bunch of common um, activities that everyone is doing, right? Like everyone's doing bell runs, everyone's doing, you know, Diablo, everyone's maybe, maybe you get a couple Pindle skins or Cow King, right? Just, just really quickly, because um, you know, I, I know he's going to get into the the whys and the wither twos of, of how they are, you know, the the reasons, the excuses why they did this particular thing. But, um, but I'm going to be honest with you, they never should have changed it. They should have left it exactly the same. They should have just had the keyboard and the mouse. And if people complain that they needed a more efficient way of doing things, well, then they could have they could have added things in. But, but the way that they did it was they literally took away the core of what Diablo two was, and and of course they were going to get backlash from that. Right. Like, um, and so we're like, well, we'll just take the list of things people want to do and then we'll match make you with other people who want to do that. Right. Like, cool. Like you went and you're like, cool, I'm going to go make a game and you click the button and look, it's the, it's the quest menu, you know, and love. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go play the cow king and you click it and you'd play how many type in how many players you wanted and what difficulty you want. And you're like, oh, we got this. It's great. Um, but like it, it didn't really work because fundamentally the game was not meant to be an activity driven game like every console now everything's activity driven especially you get like a ps5 everything's an activity feed right um what con what parties are has changed right and so um because the game wasn't built to be activity driven you could go ahead and say hey guys i want to run cow king and you click it the game doesn't change the state of the world, right? It doesn't spawn you in the Cow King level. It doesn't set your world to be Cow King. All it does is tell other people you said you wanted to do it, right? So you would jump in and your waypoint might be in Hargaroth and the other person that joined might be in Rogue Encampment and you're there, you're in the same game and we auto partied you up. But like 
We just have to trust that you do the thing you said you were going to do, right? And so um, that we had essentially a huge outcry for like, hey, can we just get PC stuff on the console? Which was not what we expected our audience wanted at all. We were like, no, like all our diehard fans are going to stay on the PC. They're the new PC master race. They're never going to move over. Um, but no, they did. They're like, no, I'm, I love playing on my console. I want to play on my giant screen TV sitting on my couch. Just give me all the things I could do on a PC. And I was like, oh, okay. So, so yeah. So like I said, stay tuned. Hopefully we fixed it in the future. Um, but it's one of those things that I think when we first came out, we missed the mark on. Um, I'm actually kind of excited to, uh, to hear about their, their supposed fixes for this. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, so in a kind of start to summarize here, like for post-launch learning, like I think what went well was the game totally felt like D2, right? It was just prettier. I loved what we did with the controller. I think we nailed on our vision. Not everyone agreed with what our vision was, um, but we nailed it. Um, we definitely exceeded actually our visual and audio goals. Um, and the zoom toggle feature went over huge, right? Like I remember watching streamers when it first came out, like literally they would go to every zone and they'd be like, zoom in toggle, zoom out. Like, and they'd be like, oh, look at this. And look, it was like, they were going back to their old friend and seeing things they never saw before. So that was amazing. Um, what was poor was we definitely misjudged the number of PC players who wanted to play on their console. We thought that they were like separate groups. They weren't. Um, yes, garlic. Thank you. I love that people did that. Um, in fact, actually, I'll show you guys something fun with garlic. So I had uh, I, every project I make, I work on, I have coins made up for the team. And so um, this is the coin for uh, the D2 team. Um, and, uh, you know, I got the little chat gem on the back. But I actually went and put in, if you can, uh, here we go. If you can see, there's actually a little piece of garlic there. So, because I had to put garlic in it. Um, so, yeah. So, um, man, who's ever sharing the screen thing? Johnny on the spot. I, I really want one of those coins. Like, can I have one of those coins, please? Um, the server, our server, like, we did not expect it to be hit as hard as it was. Um and so that was that was a big thing. We it, we got out of it like a couple of days later, but and especially like you'd like to say that in this day and age people should know that you're. It's like no, it's kind of unacceptable. We should have done better. Um, and then yeah, like I said, like I think we nailed our vision, but I don't think everyone agreed with our vision. Some people wanted us to be even truer to the old game. Other people wanted um, us to have brand new stuff. They're like, why isn't there a whole new act? Why aren't there five new classes? And it's like, whoa, now like. We're, it's it's a restoration of, a, of an old game, not in not Diablo four, right? Like it's like we we didn't want to take it away from D two. We didn't want to give you the next Diablo. Like in fact, they already made that. It's called Diablo three, right? And if you want to do more than that, they're making Diablo four. Turns out, right? So yeah, when is that? We actually ask that all the time. When is that next system now? Um. So to summarize, if you guys are going to do a remaster, like know who you're making the game for, right? Like um. They're the people who it's most important to, right? Uh, and you want to respect that the world has changed around it, right? You can't just copy and paste it because the world is different. Um, decide what type of remake you're making. Are you remaking a remake, a remaster, a reimagining? Um, but you have to have a clear vision in the beginning. You can't keep wishy-washy. You're like, this is the game we're going to make it stick to it. Because there's definitely times where it's just like, I don't know what we're going to do here, right? Um, really hard. Like, we, we discussed auto gold pickup for a very long time. Um, and I'm very glad we added it, um, but but it did change it. And people like oh, people, might, people not want might not want auto gold. And it was like I don't know, ten minutes in, everyone was like, oh my god, thank you for auto gold pickup. Um, and then lastly, be transparent with your community, right? Like um, I think that a lot of times there's this worry of like, oh well, we'll you know we we have to have everything perfect before we message it out. The great thing, at least that we got to cheat with this one, is like we were humble enough to know that like. Um, our community was probably smarter at some parts of our game than we were, right? Like there were people who literally knew every single drop rate, every single thing, and we could look it up, right? But they knew it, they lived it, they breathed it. And to not respect that your community might even know more on things than you do, like, please just give them the benefit of the doubt, like, and just be like totally transparent with them. Um, now on that note, you guys get more bonus slides. And that is my personal takeaways, right? So. I've actually learned a lot about games that I will work on in the future by working on this game. And so, you know, games 
were made differently back then. Um, and some of those things, I think like we've lost how games used to be made for the sake of progress um, and not necessarily for, for a better thing. So um, one of the things I learned from the past was like, don't over tune your game. I think there's this concept of like overbalancing everything and it will make your game feel samey, right? Like um, a lot of times, like in making modern games, we use something called heat maps or death maps, right? Where you're like, okay, here's a level. We're going to have a hundred people play it. And wherever they die, we're going to put a dot. And then we're going to go look at the map and we're going to say, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of red dots right here. We should fix it, right? And sometimes you shouldn't. Like that little red dot area, I guarantee about most of your audience is talking about that. They're like, oh my God, did that thing kill you? Yes, that thing killed you. How'd you get around it, right? Like that's that's an okay thing to do. Don't overbalance it. And in fact, you don't want to overbalance it. Like you want to like, sh like shake up the ant hell from time to time, but like don't, don't try to get everything perfect, right? Um, and also like this came up a lot, the whole like get good attitude, right? Like that is kind of trash and we don't want that, but it is okay to say, hey, you know what? This game is going to ask a little bit more of you right now, right? Um, and I think sometimes we forget that. It's okay to be like, you know what? Players can get better. Players can get smarter. They can figure out your game. In fact, that's kind of part of what the fun of the game is, right? I mean, a really good example of literally something like that is Duriel. Um, Duriel kills a lot of players, especially early on. Um, if your character is not built properly, if you don't know what you're doing, if you go in there completely you know, unaware... Um, if you uh, if you go in there multiple times, like literally just thinking you can smash your face into Duriel, Duriel is going to smash your face. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that Duriel smashes your face. In a modern game, they would have fixed Duriel, and they would have they would have fixed him and made it so that he was easy to get through and that everyone had, a, had an opportunity to get past him easily. But uh, that's not what Diablo 2 did. Diablo 2 did, made a, made a troll monster boss who literally checked people and, uh, and you know, sent them into these pain points. Uh, literally, Dia Duriel is definitely a pain point in the Diablo 2 universe. And, uh, and he is where you realize that you have to, uh, you know, you have to, you have to build your character a little better. You got to go back. You got to find out, you know, what you did wrong. And, um, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, as he's saying. So yeah, don't overtune. That was the thing I learned. Um, that's not an excuse for me to be lazy, right? It's just still tune your games. But um, secondly, the community talks. Now, I don't mean the community talks as in they share their opinions, because we all know they do that. Uh, but it's more that your knowledge holders like to share their knowledge, right? Like having something that requires your community to work with each other, like the people who know about it, they're going to tell the people who don't know about it. And that's actually totally cool, right? Like to be like, no, we're gonna list every single thing in the game and uh, just assume that you play in a box and you play by yourself. Like, it's like, no, people don't do that, right? Like, especially in this day and age when we have streamers and content creators, like those people are your like best friends. Like they're helping other people play the game. And that's that's a good thing, right? Um, so yeah. Um, for three and four, you don't always have to handhold the player, right? Like it's okay to expect your players to be smart. In fact, most of the time they are smarter, like, then, then you'd give them credit for. Um, it's okay to have to figure out your game, right? Like figuring out a game is a type of fun, right? Now I'm not saying like be obtuse and hide things in weird spots. I mean, I love hiding things in games. Like that's a total other story I could tell you, but like um, it's okay to, to like, once again, it was this whole thing of everyone who played D2, they're like, where's the dot on the map that I follow? Where's the line that I trace? And we're like, you don't get that. And they were like, oh. And then like 10 minutes later, they're like, oh, I found it. And like the joy they got from the experience of having to search was good. Um, four, always be transparent, honest. You know, it's okay to not know all the answers, but just tell your community you don't know. Because if you don't tell the community, they're going to assume that you have the worst idea ever. Like, it's just a thing. If you don't know, you're going to assume the worst. Um, although I'm a New Yorker, maybe that's a thing. Um, but yeah, don't just communicate the what. Tell people why you did it, right? There, there's lots of times that we had to make a call and we knew that people weren't going to agree with it. But we're like, hey, we had to make this call. And this is why we made the call. And they're like, oh, okay. You did think about it. We still don't like you. But at least. Oh, my God. We still don't like you. Uh, literally, that's what he said. 
So number three, stop hand-holding. I absolutely love that he understands this, and I wish that a lot of modern game developers would understand this, that literally holding your hand through everything is not necessary. Dear Lord Jesus, I don't need an indicator. I don't need a map dot. I don't need you to tell me where every objective is. I don't need you to tell me how to gear up my character. I don't need you to tell me everything. Like, you take away all the enjoyment from the game when you do that. Literally to the point where the person who is playing is literally not even playing. You're playing. You're just doing everything for them. At least now we know why you did it, right? And it, it just went over way, way better. Um, and then last but not least is there, there, there is no sacred cow, right? Like, don't settle on something because, well, that's how it's always been done, right? Like, you want to respect your fans, but you don't want to live in fear of them. Um, like, drive your vision but you can't let your drive, drive the vision drive you, right? So like an example I'm gonna use here is we recently um, retuned uh, the Druid. Now uh, the old Druid had um, an attack speed, right? Like you get attack speed in, in D2 and your um, because of it, you, your character will play faster animations, right? The way that the math was done for how attack speed gets applied to a druid while in bear or wolf form was, let's just say, crazy math. And I'm going to get into it. It was bonkers math. Most people didn't understand how it worked. Um, and it was just like a thing. Yes, the, the, the druid, it was totally insane. So we're like, we're going to fix this, right? And so we did. But the problem was, is that it made the regular werewolf a little slower than it used to be. And it made the bear much, much slower because it turns out the way that the community had figured out to play was be in bear form with max attack speed. And so you had like lightning fast bear. And that's just what the community had. Like that was the I win button with the Druid, at least with that build. And looking at the code, looking at how it was built, we were like, this is not actually the intention of what they want. And it was an example of like, if you, you know, the old saying like, you know, you know, uh, Henry Ford didn't give people cars because if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have just said a faster horse, right? Like, you, you don't always ask what they want. And we're like, no, you know what? We're going to say that, you know what Bear is? Bear is slow, powerful, and unkillable. Like, they are just an unstoppable machine. And so we fundamentally changed it. We're like, look, we're going to say werewolf is the fast one, and the bear is slow and unstoppable. And so it completely changed what bear was, like, entirely. But because we had a clear vision of why we did it, people were like, oh, okay, well, that's that's a, like a vision. That's a thing. But no one asked for that. No one wanted that. Um, and had we said, no, we can't change it. We have to stick with the past. We would have never even got to that point. Um, and the other thing is it's a, it's a live game, right? Like if everyone truly hated it, it's like, okay, well, we just patch it again next season and tweak it back and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, this was a big thing, especially when it comes to remastering any game is you can't, you can't place it on such a perfect pedestal that you're never going to change it right um so yeah so there you go we can enter the questions phase i caught some of them i know there was a whole bunch of questions that i couldn't get to hopefully people had uh so hopefully people wrote it down so yeah i managed to catch a few questions and set them aside so we'll run through that but before that was amazing Oh, thanks. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. No, what it, it was like a super cool deep dive that was like lightning round. Um, it was riveting. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. All right. Let me jump over to these questions really quickly. And if I happen to have um, set aside any that you already addressed, just say that you already addressed it unless there's more wow. you want to you wanna say to it. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, first um, question was, what were some fun updates that with higher fidelity revealed some cheeky developer 20 years ago in other words did you when you were upping fidelity on things did you find some stuff that people hid um in the game um well so take the um easter eggs oh man it's even slipping my brain um the sanctuary the the escher level my brain has literally mm -hmm. totally pooped the bed um okay so you have a level that's that they basically hacked because it was 2D and they drew it to look right. in 3D. We had to make it in 3D, like for realsies, because it was in 3D. Um, and so with that, like you definitely saw exactly how they did it. And we basically had to use the same cheat. Um, the one thing we couldn't do, um, 
and I don't think anyone caught us on this, but like the original game had perspective mode, mm-hmm. which was a glorified parallax. And if you guys don't know what parallax is, it's where you have a bunch of layers and one layer moves slower than the other. Um, like, yeah, Arcane Sanctuary. Oh my God. I'm like, how did my brain? <laughs> so like they tried to fake it to look like there was an FOV. Well, as soon as our game became a real 3D, we went and put it in a non-orthographic camera. Um, their math was not accurate. Not at all. Like they were faking what it could look like in 3D. And don't get me wrong. They did a good job, right? It looked cool. Um but it did not give people what they wanted. And so for the longest time, we tried to preserve perspective mode in 3D and we're just like, it's not working. But even that, if you try to turn on perspective mode in Arcane Sanctuary, it's just like, nope, we're not gonna let you do that. Like they, even they knew they're like, yeah, you're not, mm-hmm. no hard pass. Um, so yeah, um, that was like a, a little, little bit. There's also like a lot of art that we um, when- I love my new home. I always wanted a house with his- Like three pixels. You're like, oh, it's a thing. But when we'd actually get like, because a lot of the original art was lost, right? Um, and there's always this talk about, oh, there was a fire. And oh, there was this. And this was backed up. And like, one thing for like, I don't know if everyone who's not a developer knows this, but like, you have your game, right? And your game is built, right? Like at some point, you're going to run a bunch of code. It's going to compile a bunch of things. It's going to compress them all down. And bam, you burn it to a disk or a floppy or, you know, your your golden image. Um, And that's the game, but you have probably 50 times that of assets and things you use to create that, right? And so it's like, at the end of the day, when you have like a harpy, it's like, cool, here's the harpy. The only thing that goes in the game is a few sprites, but there's tons of like models and animations and concept art and all of that that goes in. So that's where things were lost. And so we had some of them. We didn't have some of them. But we had some really crazy cool concept art of like, like I just saw an NPC and I, and I must have seen him 9 billion times. But it was like, oh, actually, like he was missing a, a bunch of fingers and he only had one foot. And I was like, what? And then you zoom in on the concept and you look at And once we would then model it in 3D and then bring it forward, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, that is what that is, right? Like, and in fact, even diehard people, they were like, that character has a helmet? And then they'd zoom in and it used to be six pixels. And they're like, holy crap, he does have a helmet. Like, it was really... You know, he just gave me the most interesting idea uh, that I think would be really cool is um, having a uh, a sort of an art kind of like extras feature in Diablo 2 Resurrected where we could go into like an extras menu and pull up the art for like a particular character, maybe like a 3D model examiner. Um, you know, and then also like he, he's talking about this video game archaeology where he goes into the past. Like, I think it would be really cool to have a um, kind of like a, a, an artwork thing where you could literally see the original artwork and uh, maybe even like they could they could scan in like some of the original notes or, um, you know, I think it would be amazing to see this kind of stuff like uh, in an extras sort of, you know, like menu option for Diablo 2 Resurrected. And I think it would be really well received very well received really amazing the amount of time uh, and effort they did put in like even things like some of the runes uh, or the charms they went on old like museum books and they just scanned them in and so we found the exact same museum art and we're like oh yeah this weird viking charm that was in like scandinavia in the turn of this like yeah that's the exact reference art they use so we're just going to use that reference art too Right. right. Like, so, yeah, that's so cool. I love that. Um, OK, uh, next question. Hey, Rob, cool to see you live streaming. Love the work you and the team have done on Diablo 2 Remastered. I'm not sure if you're allowed to answer this, but will we see more developer interviews for uh, DR, uh, D2R like the one you did with Mr. Llama? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, if I like if if I knew I could totally tell you because it always brings hype. Um, and so that's a, like an honest, like, I don't know. Um, I obviously love talking. I, I can do more things like this. Um, but I don't, I don't know what's in the pipe. They, they, the, um, to be as transparent as I can allow, like you have to understand that the, the media group takes into consideration everything that Blizzard is doing. And they're like, oh yeah, we, we totally want to have a D2 piece, but 
Overwatch is about to have this news or or Hearthstone is doing this thing. And you just have to kind of be wary of the environment that's coming out. And so it's like, okay, wait for wait for a slow news day. They'll do some D2 stuff, right? Like it's I think it's just kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one is the nostalgia button in D2R is super cool, but how hard was it to implement that feature? Yeah, so I, I think I said that before, like actually, um, so Rob Brinebecker, uh, he started, he was actually on the original Blizzard team at the base when he was an engineer. Um, and he actually, I think, I think he since left, left Blizzard or he, he owns a brewery now. He's a totally great guy, but he was with us at the start and he was like, you have to have that. And he called it the F5 button because that's what StarCraft had. Well, F5 is the button that engineers use to compile shit and we actually put it in and it broke a bunch of stuff. Um, and then we made it another function button. And if you played Diablo, you know the function buttons are used for things. Um, so in the end, we ended up making it the G key and we're like, well, G for graphics. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the, the reason why it just worked was because of um, both games are running at the same time all the time. Um, the one thing that we ended up changing was when you could use it, right? So originally you couldn't use it when you were zoomed in. And I was like, no, you have to let people zoom in while they're in crappy sprite mode. And they're like, what? And I'm like, do it. And we did it. And it would stayed one-to-one. -one. It was great. So that was an ad. And then we ended up turning it off for most of the front end with the exception of the campfire scene where you kind of pick your class. And that's just because it was such an iconic scene. Like, but we didn't even, I don't even think we kept the button. I think there's actually like a button you click somewhere. Um, and I apologize if I'm saying that and it ended up being cut last minute, but at some point we let you do that. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Next question here is, uh, I'm just deciphering really quick. Oh, someone was just curious about is, is there some, you know, psychological importance behind a game running at 25 frames per second? Like how movies are, a lot of movies are still running at 24. Um, Anything you want to say to that? Okay, so I can get into this. Maybe I mean I'll give you a more like nitty gritty answer. So when I went to school for animation, um, one of the like wives' tales or or myths they tell you is the human eye can actually only detect frame rate of a certain speed, and that's true um, for film. And the reason why is that when a film is captured it inherently captures motion blur. Um, and so it helps your eyes fill in the blanks. That's what your brain is doing, it's filling in the blanks. Now, if you've ever watched a movie that runs faster than 25 frames per second without motion blur, like say The Hobbit, it feels really weird because you're like, this is like a home movie. It's kind of like I'm there, right? Like, and you're, it kind of screws with your brain. But with video games, like people are very used to it, right? Like a video game is always kind of sat in that uncanny valley. And so... Um, when it comes to how it feels, more about what I was talking about is not just the meta of, okay, we already know there's a whole bunch of people who have spent a whole lot of time with Excel sheets knowing the break points of attack speed and other things like that. And we do not want to mess with that at all. We want to keep that the same thing it is. Um, but on top of it, just like, I think there was a whole lot of people who didn't know that there was any of that math going on, but they still would just mash the button and things would happen. And we wanted to keep that kind of muscle memory feeling the same. Like, mm. One of the goals uh, was a player should be able to play Diablo 2 in the morning, go grab a sandwich, come downstairs, and play Diablo 2 Resurrected, and it should just feel the exact same way. And we had actually a bunch of people do that. Like we like you talk, so we talk about Llama, talk about you know uh, Riker, like a lot of those streamers who actually play frequently. Like we had them play it, and they were just like, you literally see them, and they're like, oh, like. And they would make comments like, but it was like, the, it was like, oh, the, the particular color of blue on this one thing is off. And you're like, okay, please, this is great feedback. Take it, we'll fix it. But they weren't like, well, the game feels totally broken. Like they were literally like same speed moves they did, same tactics mm -hmm. they did, same, like there, we got a lot of feedback about like shortcuts to quick shove stuff in inventory. Cause like filling up your potions super quick is a huge thing for speed runners. Um, but yeah, like that frame rate was a lot of those things where it was just like, it was kind of black boxy where we're like, we know that there's a lot of things going on here, but we did want to let people like see the game because there was a while where we had the animations that were at 25 frames and it, it actually made the game worse because you like when you have a sprite game 
with everything running sprite level, tuk -a -tuk -a -tuk -a, right? Like you're like, oh, this all kind of blends together. It's con it's coherent, it's consistent. But if you make like the 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 freaking million poly models where you're like doing eyelashes on a barbarian, and then they move like this, like it looks a billion times worse, right? Like it, and so it's like yeah. now bring everything up at the same level. Right. No, I love that explanation. Um, let's see, we just got a few more questions here. Um, next one is how is the live service slash patches? How are, how do you finance the patches that need to continue? And they wonder because basically patches and updates have to be okay. They were just curious about, you know, so continuing to do what you need to do. Yeah. So I mean, short answer, I can't really tell you how we finance things at all. Um one thing that I just was an interesting learning experience that I can tell you about. And that is Diablo 2 is an old game that uses an old business model, right? It is not a service. You do not buy a battle pass. It is old school. Hey, we made a thing. We put it in a box. Here you go. Now go away. Like, it's kind of just how games used to be. And that's how everything was. And it's just, that's not how things, This as much as we would, I would love to still make games that way, it's just not how they're done, right? Like games, like you say, are a service, right? We have to keep up keeping them. We have stuff on our servers, right? And so it is a very delicate balance because a lot of games nowadays are built knowing they need a way to continue to finance themselves. Um, and Diablo 2 is not built that way. And I think if you were to try to retrofit it to have something like that, you could totally do it but it would change what the game was. And it's, that's where it gets kind of tricky, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, okay, so uh, I, I remember I remember some talk about this, but I don't know if you totally parsed out the answer to this question or not, so I'll just ask it. Um, does Diablo 2 Resurrected have heat maps? Um, they saw a while back that there were statistics posted from the beta. Mm, yeah, so we don't have heat maps per se. Um, partially, so, when it comes to like collecting data, I'm a firm advocate of let's only collect data that we can act upon, right? Because I could get all this data and we could spend a lot of money pinging your system and taking like everything that you have. But if we if we can't change it, right? Like if, for example, if we were like, wow, everyone keeps getting caught on this collision over here. Like we're not gonna change the collision. Like, so why do I even need to know about that, right? So we don't really have heat maps. It's also not a game that heat maps matter, right? Like every time you start the game, the whole map changes again, right? And so we do track bugs and crashes and stuff like that. Um, we try to track things like what level you were. Um, we did wanna get more detail on the economy, right? So the Diablo 2 economy is like one of those things that people have studied for a very, very long time. And we actually didn't used to have a lot of data on it, right? Like if you even look at the history of Diablo 2, there's been a lot of weird, quirky things that the developers have tried to do to like react to the economy, right? So take, for example, the auto gold debate, right? Like the reason why we put it in is, spoilers, gold stops meaning anything pretty quickly, right? You reach a point where you collect gold faster than you can even carry it. Um, and the items that you get are not from spending money. In fact, that's why the entire community invented a currency of Stones of Jordan to use them to exchange things. So much so that Stones of Jordan became so duped because they were the new seashells that they invented an event that would take away Stones of Jordan. Now, the silly thing is, is they in no way discouraged them. They just made them even more valuable. Um, but like, that whole kind of enigma was like, wouldn't it be great to have like analytics and see how these things work and see how things are traded and everything like that. Um, and we do track like the state of your character, right? So it's like, oh, you have this stuff equipped, you have this in your inventory and you logged out, cool, we saved that. But that's mostly because your character saved on Battle.net, right? Like we know what you save on Battle.net. Um, we don't care what you do offline. Um, but as to like what we're doing with that, um, mostly the data that I look at when it comes to like tuning, it's like, what's the most common class? How far did they get their level? Where do they spend their skill points? That's kind of the bulk of it, right? Cause you can get really lost. And even, like I said, you can over tune. I would really like to know what the most common class is, what the most common piece of equipment is, what the most common, uh, build is or skill used. That would be very interesting information. Uh, I would really like to know that. Um, there's also a, a ridiculous amount of rng in the game and so it's not like oh every everyone's using like uh tyrell's might 
Like, no, that doesn't happen. Like, it might be fun to be like, oh, look at that. The game's been out for four months and there's eight Tyrael's Mites that have dropped in the whole world. Like, that would be the just the laughable, entertaining stat we could use. So, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the last question I'll ask this evening is one of my own that I want to sneak. So that is actually a really cool stat, too. I would love to know that. Like, how many of each individual items have dropped? That would be so cool. Like, how many Tyrael's Mites have fallen since Diablo 2 Resurrected launched? How many how many uh, Mang Song's Lessons have dropped since Diablo 2 Resurrected launched? How many Soges have fallen since Diablo 2 Resurrected launched? That would be such an interesting uh, mechanic, uh, interesting uh, statistical bit of data to learn. Begin there. The treatment that you gave to Diablo 2, what is... Is there another game out there that you would love to to be able to do that mm. for? Diablo One. Diablo One. Good question. You're gonna have to give me a minute to think about that. Sure, no um, the treatment that we did to that. Um, Diablo One. Diablo One. And even if it's just for personal reasons, like, hey, so... I like this game and I want to see it done. So I'm going to give you a couple. There's just that. Okay, a couple. sure. A couple. Um, I would love to see a Star Fox game that doesn't look like four triangles. Mm -hmm. um, like if you could pull off Star Fox looking like Star Wars, um, yeah. that would be pretty cool. Um, I've always been a sucker for the uh, a lot of the old point and click games. So Seventh Guest, uh, Mist, Riven, yeah. like Mist. Why aren't there more of those in VR, right? Like, I, I I don't know how big VR is going to get, but it's like, those games are perfect, right? Like, I totally. absolutely, yeah. absolutely love The Witness. If you guys have never played The Witness, please go play The Witness. I mostly like The Witness because the, the way to get the real ending is uncheatable. Like, you can't just look up the answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think, or even just Secret of Mana. Like, to throw another mm -hmm. random one out. Like, a, a game that's very pixely. Um, so That's a good one. yes, the, I did say seventh guest. That is how old I am. I apologize. Seventh guest was awesome. I mean, I, I remember when when that dropped. I remember I remember playing Mist for the first time, and that just and pun intended. It was a total game changer. Um, but that's a great point. I even mean, think about how the whole point and click mechanic would work perfect for VR. That's what you have to do in VR right now. Until we all have treadmills. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's amazing. I love that. Um, well, Rob. Thank you so much. This was a huge treat. It was, and thank you for the extra content and just going over oh, yeah. everything with us. It was so much fun. Um, so we'd, we'd love to do something like this again. Um, I want to say thanks to everybody who tuned in and all of you guys' great questions. Uh, there was a ton of, like, outside of the questions that I found in the chat, there was just a lot of geeking out <laughs> happening in the chat <laughs> and a lot of comments and stuff. So it's really cool to see the community there as well. So, um, hey, yeah, thanks again. Have a great rest of your evening. And, oh yeah, uh, it's 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 morning technically for me. I'm in New York. Oh really? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, you're right, pretty this, late. This is this is coffee colored. It, it's all good. Um, yeah. But yeah, awesome. no, absolutely. Thank you. And this was a super blast. You want to have me back? I could totally talk for another couple hours. Like, um, I love great. this. And and like I said, th thanks to everyone who made comments. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, but yeah, it was super super awesome. Very cool. Um, yeah, and I get we we could do an entire live stream probably just about all the games behind right now um that would be amazing <laughs> so um all right great well have a great rest of your your time frame have a great new york um and uh everybody else stay creative stay safe and we'll see you back here for the next live stream which will be i believe the next stream we have going up is going to be on sunday uh continuing on with archetype with leticia gillett uh she is sculpting 3d stylized characters in zbrush and talking about her process and values uh, as a character artist. So we'll see you there for that. Thanks everybody and uh, good night. Thank you again, Rob. Thank you. So um, that was really cool. That was actually really, really cool. Uh, there was a lot of really interesting things in here, especially in his little speech, um, like the next hit always misses bug and how they fixed it. Um, I was really actually quite impressed with um, how he was talking about, like they went about the, um, you know, the, 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 the process of uh, remastering the game. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really good information in here. Um, I was actually very impressed with the whole don't overtune the game. Um, a lot of game makers these days do not follow this rule. It's a very, 
it's a very easy rule to break. Uh, over tuning a game too much, making making builds so ridiculously uh, pointed, um, you know, uh, making the 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 game to the point where you know everything is so perfect that people just walk through it. Um, it's very very interesting uh, that they have uh, they, that Rob Gallerani really recognized this, and I feel like any game he works on, honestly, is probably going to be pretty amazing uh, now because he understands this. I hope he's working on Diablo Four. Um, the community talks, uh, sharing knowledge holders love to share. You know, requiring your community to work together is a good thing. I mean, I'm literally my my channel is literally dedicated to this. Like, I I can't stress this enough. Like, I'm literally dedicated my channel to helping people understand how things work and um, going through the process of going over items and talking about skills and abilities and and making tutorials. I mean, it is a good thing to have your community you know, uh, interacting with each other, teaching each other, talking to each other. Um, it creates a, you know, a, a, a bond and a, a, you know, a familiarity with the game that, uh, that goes beyond just simply, hey, this is a game, you know, you, you're having fun with your friends. And, um, and then he also talks about um, a couple more things. So stop the handholding. So this is a big one that I've said about games for years. Um, it seems like the further we go into video games these days, the more handholding there is. And um, developers at some point have to realize that the handholding is not a good thing fundamentally. Um, it actually hurts your game as a whole to go through the process of holding the person's hand so ridiculously to the point where literally you feel like you're not even playing the game anymore. Um, I had this situation in a game very recently that people wanted me to play, and I and I decided to give it a try. I was like, you know what? Let's give it a try. Let's play the game. They want me to play it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna you know give it the the old college try, so to speak, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there with with you know full bore. And uh, the game was so handholdy. It was literally so handholdy that I felt like the game was playing itself. That literally I wasn't even doing anything. That the game was just playing itself, and I was just watching a movie. Um, and then the transparency and honesty thing, I really, um, I really, really admire that as well, because quite honestly, it's just a very, very good, uh, mantra to have. It, uh, it really shows that, uh, that they care about the community and they're trying to communicate why they do things, not just that they're doing things. And, uh, and I feel like when they communicate why the community can even come back with better feedback. They're like, okay, well, if this is what you're trying to achieve, then we have a couple more options for you. You know, if you would, if you would consider what we have to say. And um, so a lot of the times being honest helps the community help you. Like you literally can can work together with the community to make a solution that might be a little bit better than the one that you had originally envisioned. And, uh, and, and you're not going to get that unless you're honest with the community and tell them what you have planned. Um, he also goes over the, um, the whole, you know, there's no sacred cow thing. Uh, which basically is like, um, you know, sometimes things have to be changed. Um, like, for instance, the Druid was in a pretty poor place in Diablo 2. Um, I think he always was. I don't think he was ever really properly balanced. And um, and so he did have a lot of issues with him. The martial art assassin also had a lot of issues with her. Um, and they changed these things. Um, and they're not the same as Diablo 2. But they, I think, honestly, they've done a really good job changing them for the better. Um, could they still tweak them? Yes, uh, I feel like there's still some tweaks that could be uh, done. I believe the uh, bear sorceress is still in a bad place, uh, needs needs some love, and the bear, the wolf barbarian also needs a little bit of love. Um, and it's probably due to their changes on the druid, but the druid is definitely in a much better place now than he was previously. Um, and, uh, and certainly that is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and then he also talked about the consoles, uh, which I was actually really excited uh, that... Um, we're going to get some changes on the consoles. And um, he said something about we were going to get some information later. Um, let me go back real quick and I'm going to take a look at this. All right, and here it is right here uh, where he talks about we're going to get more information on the console lobbies. It is something that if you are still playing D2R, and I hope you are, uh, there'll be something fun coming up. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to let our community manager talk about that. Um, but... So I'm not going to spoil it. We're going to let our community manager talk about that. If you're unaware of who the community manager is for Diablo 2 Resurrected, uh, the community manager for Diablo 2 Resurrected is um, Pez Radar. Pez Radar is the uh, community manager. So 
I'm assuming we're going to get some um, some information from Pez Radar soon on the uh, on the lobbies, the 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 state of the lobbies essentially. So uh, that's going to be really exciting. I'll have to keep my eyes open for that. Um, in fact, you know, as I'm talking right now, I'm literally like going and checking uh, Pez Radar's Reddit account and uh, and other things to see if he has actually posted anything on this because uh, I'm actually pretty excited to hear if they're going to be changing. Uh, the quality of life for the uh, the lobbies on the consoles. I know a lot of people are excited about the console changes and really want to see this stuff go forward. Um, I feel like two hours is a really long time for this. That's pretty much the, a full-length feature film at this point. So I'm going to end it here. Uh, this was actually really, really cool. And um, I would love to hear Rob Gallarani talk some more um, and gush over his Diablo 2 Resurrected uh, experiences. In fact, I'd love to hear the kind of like archaeology that he did in the background and the and the art that he found and all the little cool things that he did. Because quite honestly, like a lot of that stuff, I swear, would make really good extras for Diablo 2 Resurrected. You know, if you're if you're listening to Rob Gallarani, get on that. Literally, like let's get an extras for Diablo 2 Resurrected. Let's get art assets. Let's get 3D models that we can view. Um, you know, let's get uh, let's get like original like developer notes and stuff that we can look at. Like I wanna I wanna be able to like go to like in Inside of Diablo 2 Resurrected, I want to be able to go to like a Diablo 2 uh, uh, museum, and I want to be able to walk through and like and like see the Diablo 2 world in like a Diablo 2 museum, um, you know, like inside of inside of Diablo 2 Resurrected. I think that would be just absolutely amazing. Um, as always, I do appreciate you guys and gals watching my videos, and uh, keep watching.